A reading from the book of Acts, chapter 20, verses 7 through 12. On the first day of the week, when we meet to break bread, Paul was holding a discussion with them. Since he intended to leave the next day, he continued speaking until midnight. There were many lamps in the room upstairs where we were meeting. A young man named Eutychus, who was sitting in the window, began to sink off into a deep sleep while Paul talked still longer. Overcome by sleep, he fell to the ground three floors below and was picked up dead. But Paul went down and bending over him, took him in his arms and said, do not be alarmed for his life is in him. Then Paul went upstairs and after he had broken bread and eaten, he continued to converse with them until dawn, then he left. Meanwhile, they had taken the boy away alive and were not a little comforted. This is the word of God for the people of God. A church that delights in God's presence, a church where faith is being transformed in Jesus Christ, a church that's missionally focused, a church that expects more of God and one another. These are some of the very building blocks of the church God is dreaming for us to be. To those could we add another, that God is here calling us to be alive with the disciplines of Christian faith. Could you dream with me of a church where we are together being made alive with the disciplines of Christian faith? Edward Cohen was the senior rabbi at Temple Sinai in New Orleans. He tells one of those classic minister, priest, rabbi kinds of stories. You know the kind of stories. Well, as it turns out, these three, all of them friends, were gathered one evening and uh, the talk got rather serious as they uh, considered uh, what it might be like at their own funerals. Said the minister, you know, when they pass by my casket, I'd like them to look at me and say, there, there is a woman who cared for her congregation, who was there when they were sick and where, when they were grieving, who loved her flock. The priest was the next to chime in. You know, he said, when they passed by my casket, I'd like them to say, there, there was a man of character, a man of justice who stood up for the poor, who fought for the rights of the little people. The rabbi was the last to speak. He was more reflective than the others, kind of stroking his beard. Finally, after a while, he said, you know, when they pass by my casket, I'd like them to look at me and say, hey, look, he's moving. <laughs> Shouldn't we all be so lucky? Lucky was the name of the boy in our scripture lesson today, literally Eutychus. His name in Greek means fortunate or lucky. His may be really the funniest story in all the New Testament. Of course, when it starts out, it's not really so funny, especially for him. He's at church. It's a night worship service. He's in his stuffy church clothes. He's got to listen to a guest preacher. And you know what happens when a guest preacher comes to town. Everybody who really is lucky kind of disappears, right? But he, not him, he had to go. Of course, his parents uh, did let him sit with his friends, and they all sat in the balcony, and he did score the window seat. Now, in days without air conditioning, you can imagine that's probably a good thing in the summer heat and the a Middle Eastern climate and the service goes on and the service goes on and uh, the longer it goes the more he starts to nod 
you know the nod that happens in church, you know, kind of. <laughs> and you're trying to stay on. And you're trying to hang on. But then it was just too much. And before you knew it, he was snoring. The new RSV is about as literal a translation as you can get. It says, verse 9, Paul talked still longer. Don't you hate that? <laughs> Me too. Pretty soon, Eutychus was sawing logs and his friends started giggling and they were just waiting for someone, some adult to call him out. They were enjoying the good fun of watching him saw logs. But then all of a sudden he leaned the wrong way and splat, he fell out the window three stories down. His bones were broken. It was so loud that a widow who sat near the back, who could never hear a word that the preacher said, but always complimented him on the sermon, even she heard him fall. And shrieked out, oh my! The ushers, led by a nice fellow named Dave, were quick to gather around. They quickly grabbed a cell phone and called St. Joseph's Hospital. A nice lay leader named Dee Dee suggested, Preacher, why don't you pray to distract everybody else? The parents were sobbing. That's when Paul... Uh, takes him in his arms. Verse 10, but Paul went down and bending over him, took him in his arms and said, do not be alarmed, for there is life in him. Which is to say, look, he's moving. We should all be so lucky. And could it be that there is one who is here today who would gather us just as well in a loving embrace and to pronounce over each of us there is life in him, there is life in her, there is life here at First Church. You know, every year since Methodists from our very beginning have been gathering, We've been singing that song that we sang at the beginning of our worship service written by Charles Wesley, And Are We Yet Alive? It's a good and fair question. Are we? Are we alive? Every once in a while it ought to be asked of us each spiritually, Are you alive? Are you alive? Are you alive? Which is to say, don't we pray together that God would look out over us and say, Look, they are moving. Do not be alarmed. There is life in her. There is life in him. Too often instead we're much more like that bored boy perched on a window ledge, nodding off, spiritually dozing, so how about it? Could you take a minute and take your spiritual pulse? How is it with your soul? How is it with your soul? There are four ways, I think, that we can get to be that, that boy. For starters, in fairness, there are some days when our bodies are hurting. And isn't it hard? To give attention to your spiritual life when your physical bodies aren't at their very best? I think it's an especially difficult challenge. The older we get, the aches and the pains, they wear on you. That's one possibility. It, it can happen, too, that we get weighed down with worry for our family, for our friends, with work. And the more worry that piles on, the more difficult it is to, to stay in touch spiritually. As Charles Wesley's song declares, What troubles have we seen, what mighty conflicts past? 
fightings without and fears within since we assembled last and fears within and as those fears eat on us and pile on us doesn't it get harder to give attention to our spiritual lives there's a third possibility maybe you've already considered it you got to be that that guy up there because somebody else is to blame you know we can do this all we have to do is blame somebody else it's our spouse it's let me help you with this it's the preachers fault we didn't get fed right and eventually we become something of a spiritual codependent. Those are three reasons. Let me add a fourth. Because maybe you have tried it. Maybe you've tried offering the passing prayer. Or dabbled in reading scripture. You know, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus. And you get there and you get kind of slogged down. And you've tried it. You've tried the spiritual disciplines. To speak for us today, uh, I've invited a guest with us, uh, a famous Missourian. You'll recognize Missouri's native son, Huck Finn. Huck, are you there, Huck? He's coming. Then Miss Watson took me in the closet and prayed, but nothing come of it. She tr told me to pray every day, and whatever I asked for, I would get. But it weren't so. I tried it. I once got fish line, but no hooks. It weren't any good to me without hooks. I tried three or four times for the hooks, but I just couldn't get it to work. By and by, one day, I asked Miss Watson to trap for me, but she said I was a fool. She tried to tell me why, but I didn't get it no way. I sat down one time in the woods and had a long think about it. I said to myself, if a body doesn't get anything won by praying, why don't Deacon win get back the money he lost on pork? Why can't the widow get back her silver snuff box? Why can't Miss Watson fat up? <laughs> no, says I to myself. There ain't nothing in it. I went out in the woods and turned it over in my mind a long time to see no advantage about it. So at last, I reckon I wouldn't worry about it no longer, but just let it go. Daniel House helping us this morning. You know what it is like Huck Finn to turn it over and over and finally just give up because you don't see any advantage to it? And if we're not careful, we can become that boy. We can become the one who's fallen asleep at our spiritual lives. Which brings me today to a recommendation. Don't just depend on what happens here for your spiritual vitality. In fact, if this is all you've got, it may not be enough. In fact, if all you've got is coming to worship Sunday morning, it'll be easy for you to slip into the sin of becoming a spectator in faith. So today I really do want to challenge you in some concrete ways, five of them in particular. If you're not already doing it, could you determine today that you'll read your Bible? If you haven't been doing it regularly, faithfully, by the way, have we got a plan for you. These are available in the back of the church, a 52-week sermon, uh, sermon plan, a 52-week Bible reading plan. And 
How about prayer? Could you make a commitment today to doing more than just the passing prayer? How about, could you make a commitment today to pray for just one minute? Get your watch out, set it on a table by you, and pray for one minute. And then tomorrow, pray for two minutes. I'm not asking for you to pray for two minutes. I'm talking to you, pray for two minutes long, right? And then get your watch out the third day and go for three. And you know what? Before you know it, you'll be praying for 30 minutes a day. And with your giving, could you consider increasing your giving by just 1%, enough to stretch you to make a real commitment. And how about service? Have you found a place to plug in and actually live your faith out? I worked with a lay leader a couple years ago who said, first comes the doing, then comes the learning. And have we got some doing for you. If you haven't seen it in your bulletins, there's this list of summer service opportunities. Places for you to plug in and to live out your faith. And then, last but not least, there's also in the bulletin this morning uh, a flyer about small group uh, Bible studies. If you're not in an accountability group, a, a group that gathers together to ask that ancient of questions, how is it with your souls? Could you commit this day to being a part of such a group? You know, it's nice to gather for quilters or a sewing group or some other group, but we're talking about a place where your faith can be considered, where in a small setting, others can hold us accountable, where together we can grow and commit to the disciplines of Christian faith. Can you promise, can you make a commitment this day to taking at least one step to nurturing your own spiritual life? I know and am confident that God who is here this day would want nothing more than to lift us up and hold us in his great span and pronounce over each of us there is life in him, there is life in her. I don't know about you, but when I use my baptized imagination, I can imagine that the Sunday after his great fall, Eutychus was right there toward the front on the next Sunday. Can you believe that? And can you believe that that week, as soon as he was able, he started reading his Torah every day and praying a little bit here and a little bit there until it added up to a whole bunch? And I've got to believe and imagine him gathering his friends together and saying, hey, could we work together on our spiritual lives? My friends, this leads me to say, my sermon is finished. I won't go still longer. But I'm glad to see you are still very much alive. Thanks be to God.